I'm tired of getting the fuzzy end of the lollipop. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah from Everyday Starlet. Welcome to my channel. I make videos to inspire you to be the star of your own life. I'm continuing my Masculine Feminine Energies film breakdown series with the classic Some Like It Hot. If you're not familiar with what I mean by Masculine Feminine Energies, I have a ton of videos on this content, but a brief summary. Masculine and Feminine Energies are energies that live within all of us. We all contain both energies, but we all have a core energy that's the one we're most ourselves in. That energy often links up with our gender. It doesn't have to, but it very often does. We can be in wounded or healed versions of either of these energies, and each of these energies contains archetypes. We all contain all of the archetypes within us so we can tap into whenever we need to. I have a lot of videos about the masculine and the feminine archetypes if you want to learn more. And in order to have sexual polarity in a relationship, you need one partner to be in the masculine and one partner to be in the feminine. Because opposite energies attract sexually and same energies repel sexually. So let's get into some like it hot. I get a ton of requests for Marilyn Monroe movies. I already have a ton here on my channel. The very first breakdown that I ever did, which actually inspired this whole series, was How to Marry a Millionaire. It's my first one, so it holds a special place in my heart. You never forget your first time. I also have a breakdown of a seven year itch and also of the misfits which is probably my favorite Marilyn role as far as a breakdown goes. The misfits was probably her most like organically feminine role probably because it was written for her. To be honest some like it hot has never been my favorite Marilyn movie. For me it just kind of drags a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I just got that drags if you've seen the movie you'll get it but in some like it hot Marilyn Monroe is the epitome of a wounded feminine character and there's a lot of examples of love bombing in this which I'm gonna get into I do want to know that the last film breakdown I did was actually the movie gaslight which dives very deep into psychological abuse and gaslighting and things like that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about love bombing in this video, which is separate than gaslighting, but they're very often found together. I didn't intend to do two film breakdowns back to back that were about sort of psychological abuse and manipulation. That's just kind of the way it worked out. But if you want to dive into more aspects of psychological abuse and manipulation, I highly recommend that you watch my gaslight breakdown. This breakdown, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the wounded feminine and love bombing. Before I get into that, a brief summary of the film itself. Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon play Joe and Jerry. They're musicians. This movie's actually from 1959, but it is set in the 1920s during Prohibition. And Joe and Jerry accidentally witness a, like, a mob execution and they're the only witnesses they're on the run they're trying to hide out they have no money they're not able to get jobs and they end up basically dressing up like women to join an all-girls band so they can hide out from these gangsters that are trying to assassinate them and so they can make some extra money and get a free trip from Chicago to Florida so Joe becomes Josephine and Jerry becomes Daphne because this is a comedy they do kind of play up a little bit of the differences in how they get treated as women as opposed to how their life is as a man, which is kind of interesting how when Jerry is Daphne, he's kind of like trying to figure out how to walk in heels and he's like, oh, there's like a draft because he's not used to wearing skirts. There's actually a really poignant scene at one point. Jerry as Daphne makes a comment about like just getting pinched in the elevator because, you know, he's not used to essentially being sexually harassed. It's a different time period, so that was actually much more common back then where men were just like pinch a woman if they were attracted to her. And <laughs> his argument is it's like I'm not even attractive. Like I'm not even an attractive woman, essentially. Joe is is like, doesn't matter. They don't care if you're attractive or not. It's the skirt. It's like a flag to a bull. And Jerry's like, I don't want to be the flag anymore. I want to be the bull. There's something to the idea that oftentimes we can think that the other gender has it better or easier. When in reality, there's positives and negatives to being either gender. For the most part, even though oftentimes we can get into this, the grass is always greener on the other side. Our biology is actually designed for experiencing the world in gender that we are. So as men, I think sometimes you can get into this idea of like, oh, wouldn't it be really great if, you know, I was the one who was being pursued, if I was the one who was being chased, if I got to lean back. And a lot of guys are doing that now, but most men are never really going to be truly satisfied that way. They might get addicted to kind of that laziness of leaning back and letting people come to them, but those relationships are probably not going to truly satisfy them. And I think also too, in a lot of ways, women think that, okay, well, if they could be in control and they could be the ones that made the decisions and did the pursuing, for example, that life would be better. And I think a lot of women do that and they may even get into relationships that way. But the reality is for most women, they're never going to truly be satisfied with a relationship that goes that way. I'm not somebody who is 
saying that everybody has to stick to these very rigid structured gender roles. But in reality, most of these gender roles, generally speaking, were created and evolved this way because they're they're connected more to our nature. As, as women, we are really designed to be more open and receptive, not saying that we should accept just getting pinched by random men in an elevator. And for men, they're gonna be much more comfortable doing the pursuing. Even though it might be difficult for them, even though a lot of men don't actually know how to step into being a healthy pursuer in a relationship, and a lot of men aren't being taught actually how to step into their masculine energy. At the root of it, most of us are gonna end up being at our best when we're in our natural core energy. <laughs> There's actually was, something I dove into a lot more in my seven year itch breakdown is this idea that like if we just shifted things backwards to like just before feminism happened we just pretended feminism didn't happen and we just went back into a time period in the past when men were men and women were women and I think when people start idealizing this kind of like 1950s idea I think what you see are examples of men who were not really embodying their masculine they were embodying their ego like a masculine man is not gonna randomly go up and like grab a, a strange woman's butt because you know he thinks she's attractive that's not a masculine man that's a man who's living from ego who thinks he's entitled to a woman's body because he's attracted to her that's not masculine energy and that's where we get really confused in our society i think oftentimes by thinking that like that makes a masculine man and a lot of what's happened with feminism and with women's rights and granted i have a whole video where i talk about that and that movement and i'm not going to get into that there were pluses and minuses to that whole thing but i think one of the reasons why that movement took off as it did was because there were a lot of men who were living from ego and feeling like they had a right to women's bodies. The oldest saying in the world, absolute power corrupts absolutely. When you give men absolute power over women, there are gonna be some men who are gonna wield that power in an absolutely respectful way. A lot of them aren't. That's where you get into the idea where men think that they can just go around and grab women's butts. And again, like they point out in this movie, if men were on the other side, and were being exploited in that way and their boundaries were being crossed that way they wouldn't like it so that's not the direction i'm going to go in with this breakdown but i do think that those things are are important to note when you look back at movies like that like you know the seven year itch is a great example of that and you look at a time period in history when men were basically living from their ego and were using a lot of their power in society to be more abusive that's where you get women who then fought back and were like we're not going to accept this now i'll be the first to say i think that feminism was for sure hijacked and went to a lot of different directions that were not necessarily helpful and productive but that's for a whole other video and i have a lot of videos on here about that topic you also do see too that oftentimes even when people are somewhat wounded and i would say that jerry for sure is not exactly grounded in his stability in fact his relationship with joe even early on is very much jerry is sort of the follower and joe is kind of the leader but he's kind of leading from his ego joe clearly has a gambling problem he's always gambling with all their money which is usually a sign of wounded feminine uh, i think joe kind of has a lot of wounding in general so he, he also is gambling away jerry's money he's living from ego he's got a lot of wounding in his masculine and his feminine for sure and Jerry's kind of, he's a little, he's erratic, he's unstable, he's kind of following Joe around, whereas, um, like, Joe's kind of, like, the leader, but he's not really leading well. They're kind of always getting themselves in trouble, and Jerry's kind of, like, the follower. But I do think it's significant that they're both very attracted to Sugar at first. In fact, there's an iconic scene where, you know, they're trying to walk to the train awkwardly as you know, dressed as women for the first time, and Sugar kind of walks by them with her iconic Marilyn Monroe walk, which there's a lot of theories about why her walk was so iconic. Some people believe that she actually would shave down the heel of one of her shoes, so it gave her like a wobble, which it gave her a little bit of instability and accentuated her wiggle. I'm not very much a fan of getting too caught up in superficial feminine ideas. That said, walking with your hips and feeling into your hips is a really great way of connecting to your feminine energy and it's not just about like being sexy for a man or showing things off for a man or having an artificial walk, although it may feel a little awkward at first. When you as a woman 
are walking with your hips and feeling your hips and letting them flow. For one thing, it opens up your hips because many of us have incredibly tight hips, which especially as a woman, having really tight hips is gonna be, it's gonna cause you know physical health problems. It can also cause uh, mental health problems, things like that. Like being able to connect and open up your hips is a really great way of you know getting the circulation going, of moving your feminine energy, of feeling into your body. As women today, often we don't move our hips very much because you know we're trying to suppress any expression of too much sexuality. We don't want to cause unnecessary attention to us. For many of us, there are women who over accentuate their hips because they're trying to attract attention. It's a different thing. I'm talking about a lot of women don't move their hips. Their hips are very closed. And honestly, even if you're moving them in an artificial way and so you're not really like feeling into them and letting them move naturally, you can also cause a lot of tension and strain in them too. So Having some openness and movement in your hips when you're walking can be a really great way of helping you connect into your body, connect to your feminine energy, because a lot of your feminine energy kind of comes from uh, your womb space, your, your pelvic area, and having a, a flexible pelvic area and being in tune with that and kind of like letting that move naturally it may feel awkward at first, but that's actually a really great way of connecting to your feminine energy. And a lot of men find that very attractive because again, if you notice just in that scene, it's the difference. A masculine man is going to be attracted to the feminine because of their differences. I've talked about this in other videos that if you're going to have a relationship with somebody, you're going to need to have some similarities in, you know, the things that you want in life and things like that. However, it's the differences between the masculine and the feminine that causes sexual polarity. So you have these two men who are like dressed as women because they're trying to hide out and they're awkward, they don't know what they're doing, and <laughs> they see this woman who's just like being this like natural woman, like this naturally, just, I mean, Marilyn knows how to ooze feminine sexuality better than just about anybody. You know, when they see that kind of like natural effortless feminine movement, it magnetizes them. Like it, it, it turns them on because it's so different than them. And it's those differences that actually cause the, the attraction. It's like in, in France, they call it viva la différence. It's, it's basically the, the appeal of the fact that men and women are different and that's what causes a sexual polarity. So they're drawn to her, but of course, Joe is trying to warn Jerry not to try anything because obviously they're trying to hide out. They need to keep this job. They need to hide out and everything. So they meet Sugar and I'm going to dive deeper into Sugar's character in a minute, but you find out essentially that Sugar is kind of the one that always gets caught uh, drinking and that if she's caught drinking again, she could get kicked off the train and kicked out of the group. So they're basically at band practice and Sugar's flask falls out of her garter belt where she hides it. And she's about to get in trouble. They don't know that it's her flask. She's freaked out and Jerry jumps in, of course, as Daphne and says that it's hers and basically has her back. That's a masculine protector kicking in, right? Like he's dressed as a woman. He's not exactly totally embodied in his masculine energy, but Sugar's overwhelming feminine energy kicks in his masculine drive to protect. And he knows that if Sugar gets caught with the flask, she's gonna possibly get kicked out of the group. She's gonna be out on the streets. And so he jumps in and is like, I'm gonna protect her. Like that's, that's that natural protector energy that kind of, if someone is masculine at their core, that protector energy is gonna kick in. Now, of course, because Jerry is not really a, a healed, embodied masculine man at this point he wants something from sugar and that's where things start to get fuzzy <laughs> fuzzy it's her famous line fuzzy into the lollipop because a masculine man is going to have that drive to protect and provide however if he's got a lot of wounding within him he can start operating from his ego and doing those things out of Ooh, what can i get in return now the masculine is not a receiving energy the masculine is a giving energy so when a man is not fully embodied in his masculine energy but he's masculine at his core he often will kick into that masculine instinct but his wounding either is wounded masculine or wounded feminine it kind of depends on the situation and how it how it comes out will often need something in return and that's that's where the disconnect goes and i really do believe that's one of the biggest reasons why women today have such a hard time being in their feminine receptive energy is because they're so used to men who have so much wounding so that when they do something for the feminine it comes at a cost right that's not masculine energy true masculine energy is going to give to the feminine and all he's going to ask for in return he's going to want something in return he's going to want an energy exchange her joy her pleasure her excitement like her embodying her feminine energy is the gift to him right like a true Truly embodied masculine man is going to find 
giving to the feminine, her feminine expression that she gives him as the responsiveness to what he gives her, that, that's his gift. Like, that's what he gets for it. Like, receiving a feminine woman's joy, pleasure, excitement, emotions, her flow, like, receiving her feminine energy that comes from her, comes from within, that she taps into because of his masculine energy. Like, that's the gift. That's the exchange. It's not like oh, I gave to her, so what is she going to give to me? Like, there's an energy exchange there in the giving, but he doesn't have this neediness to, okay, well, she has to give me this, or she has to give me that, or if I give her something, or I do something for her. Like, that's not an embodied masculine man, and I think that's where a lot of women get confused, because I think a lot of women have experienced men in their wounding who are needy for something in return, when that's not really what the masculine is going to do. Okay, so let's dive into sugar. Sugar is the epitome of a wounded feminine character. Oh my goodness, she is constantly downing herself. You know, you hear her say it all the time, she's just dumb. She is totally in victimhood mode. Like her famous line from this movie is, you know, I always get the fuzzy end of the lollipop. She's always getting involved with men who just use her. And like she knows that she's got this pattern. Like she knows her pattern is saxophone player. She gets involved with these saxophone players, they use her, they, you know, take any money she has, they use up all her toothpaste, and then they just disappear and move on to the next girl. And she knows she has this pattern, but she feels like she's a victim of it. Like, she can't trust herself. She says she doesn't trust herself. She does for other people. Like, she's doing for these guys. She tends to get guys in her life who she kind of can't resist, and then she does everything for them, and then they just take from her. Like, that's her pattern. Like, she knows she has this pattern, but she still continues to participate in it, even though she's aware of it, because she's she's... Again, she's kind of in victimhood. Like, she's like, well, I'm just dumb. And she just downs herself. Another sign of wounded feminine is often addictions. I mean, she's very clearly an alcoholic. She even has all the classic lines of being an alcoholic, which, again, this is a comedy, so it's kind of supposed to be funny. But, and I'm all for comedy. I'm a fan of comedy. I was a comedian for years, so I understand it. However, in a lot of these movies, especially in the comedies, I feel like when you kind of make light and humor out of some of these really toxic behaviors, traumas, wounding, things like that, or manipulative behaviors and stuff, it really does normalize it. Like it makes it seem very trivial and it makes it seem like, oh, this is just normal behavior and it's funny and entertaining. Like, yes, we should absolutely be able to laugh at ourselves. And we have to make sure that we're not just continually reinforcing a lot of these negative behaviors and patterns and making them seem like they're not as significant as they are. Because a lot of these things that are going on in this movie, while it's funny and humorous, they're actually really toxic and unhealthy patterns and dynamics. So yeah, Sugar says even that like she drinks, she's the only one that gets caught. Again, victimhood mode, all the other girls drink, which you do find out is true, all the other girls drink, but like Sugar seems to be the only one that gets caught. She's also the most high profile of all of them because she's like the lead singer. So that might be one of the reasons why she gets caught is because she is higher profile. She's a little bit more careless with the way that she does things, which oftentimes if you're doing things wrong and you're being very careless about it, that's a sign often of wounded feminine. You don't, if, if you're a feminine being and you have no, no masculine structure, you have no masculine discipline whatsoever, it's often a sign that you're wounded and you're feminine. She talks about drinking as like, well, I can stop anytime I want. I just don't want to, especially when I'm blue. Okay. That's like, that could be the anthem of an alcoholic, right? It's like, I can stop anytime I want to, but I don't want to when I feel sad, which is all the time. And I always feel sad. Like, that's like, okay, well, that's, that's alcoholism. That's depression. Those are all signs of wounded feminine behavior. Part of this is she's very trusting very quickly. Being overly trusting, not having any boundaries, not having any sort of self-respect or anything, that those things are all wounded feminine. And the fact that she's so trusting of Josephine and Daphne, Joe and Jerry, right away and just is sharing so much with them and of course she does believe that they're women so she believes she can be more open with them and doesn't have to put up as much of a guard however being way too overly trusting of strangers and then sharing way too much way too quickly can often be a sign of wounded feminine energy i'm not someone who is gonna tell people to hold themselves back to diminish themselves to be somebody they're not to not express their truth, to not share things about themselves. Those things are all great. The problem is when you don't use any discernment as to how much of yourself a person has shown that they are deserving of. So don't withhold information or pretend to be somebody that you're not, but make sure that the person you're talking to and the person you're dealing with 
has actually shown that they are trustworthy with the information that you're going to share with them, has shown that they're not going to likely use information that you're sharing with them, especially really deeply personal information. They're not going to use that against you or use that to manipulate you. It's about, it's about pacing yourself. It's about knowing like, okay, I can share something, you know, about myself that is true and genuine, but are some of my like deepest personal wants and needs and desires and things about me, like has this person shown that they're, they're trustworthy? Have they, have they shown that they're somebody who is really worthy of, of getting to know like the deepest, most vulnerable parts of me? And it's not about necessarily being guarded, but it's about just tuning into, you know, when you feel like a person has really shown that they can be trusted. And because the wounded feminine often will not use any discernment with people and will often just share way too much way too quickly, they tend to open themselves up to a lot of love bombing, which I'm going to get into in a minute. Now, in Sugar's defense, she has no idea that she's talking to two men who are very sexually attracted to her. So she shares a lot of information about her own personal patterns that she's had in relationships, how she's been hurt in relationships, and also what she's looking for in a relationship, which is interesting when she describes it, how she's, she's gonna go off and look for a millionaire. She doesn't really care much about him. She's as long as he has a yacht and his own toothpaste. I find that funny because she obviously has attached onto the idea of a yacht simply because to her, the yacht symbolizes a man with wealth and stability. In reality, Sugar doesn't really care about the yacht. If you, if you look at Sugar, and she's not really a gold digger in a typical sense of, she just wants to use a man for his money. She's seeking stability, and to her, the yacht symbolizes stability, which is kind of ironic seeing as though it's a yacht literally is on the water, so it's unstable. So she still doesn't really, hasn't really gotten the idea of stability yet. But then she says as long as he has his own toothpaste, right? Really what she wants is a man who's not going to take advantage of her. So she's created this idea, and this happens a lot with women. I, I, I've been guilty of this too, where if you have been hurt in the past, you've let men who are, you know, not very stable, are not protectors and providers, if you've gotten involved with men like that in the past, oftentimes you can then jump to having these insanely like, okay, we has to have a yacht. Like you, that's where a lot of the standards that women have, I mean, women's standards need to be high. And I have a lot of videos about this, but women need high standards because we're determining who we're going to start a family with, like who's DNA is gonna carry on to a new generation. Like women have to have high standards. There are women out there who have insanely high standards of these very specific things. And some of that is them protecting themselves from having to get into a relationship because they don't wanna get used or abused again. I mean, I'm not saying that owning a yacht is like an insanely high standard, but if you really pay attention to Sugar and her character, she doesn't care so much about the yacht, right? Like, it really has nothing to do with that. She has built up in her mind that the yacht is associated with a man being stable and having his act together. So that's really what she wants. And I have a lot of videos talking about ego versus soul needs and, you know, women's standards and really determining which standards are actually important to you. Aiming for the yacht is not necessarily going to get you what you want, unless what you really need is a man that has a yacht, because yachting is very important to you. Aiming for the yacht is kind of aiming for the wrong thing if what you're looking for is a provider. It's aim for the provider. If he happens to have a yacht, great. If he doesn't, it, what you want is a provider. That's the important thing. And the fact that it's the yacht and it's the toothpaste, it's literally like she's associated a man with a yacht as being somebody who won't use her because why would somebody use her if they own a yacht? But in reality, there's a lot of men with a ton of money that will still use and abuse a woman. The toothpaste thing is just like, I don't want to manage to steal my toothpaste again. She's basically choosing these standards based on her past trauma, not what she truly needs in her soul. She also shares with Josephine that she really wants a guy with glasses because she feels like glasses make a man seem kind, that he's obviously been straining his eyes reading a lot so he's going to be more intelligent. Those are the things that are important to her, right? She wants a man who's going to be kind. A lot of women who have been used and abused by men who are more bad boys tend to to seek out men with kindness because they perceive them as being less of a threat to them. I have a lot of videos talking about 
sort of the the bad boy versus the nice guy kind of dichotomy so i'm not gonna dive into that too much here but th there is this idea that as a woman you need a man who's going to be a protector which means a man is going to have to have a certain capacity for being dangerous however as a woman you need to make sure that that man is never going to turn that danger around on you because you need him to be dangerous to protect you from other men outside predators from like actually dangerous people but you need to make sure that that man is not dangerous to you he's not going to turn on you as a woman that's a very delicate line you have to dance so oftentimes if a woman feels like she's been in a relationship particularly with somebody who was actually dangerous to her was a danger to her was a threat to her in some way she will choose a man that has qualities that she kind of associates with weakness as a way to protect herself unfortunately a man who is in his weakness is not going to be able to protect her from other people so she's going to have a man in her life who is weak because she perceives him as safe but he's only safe in a sense that he won't hurt her but he's not he's not strong enough to protect her from other people right this is why dating for women is so difficult i love how men always act like like dating for women is so easy because we we're just supposed to like lean back and let the men do all the work well yes the men are supposed to be doing all the work because they're supposed to be demonstrating to the woman what his qualities are whether or not he is reliable whether or not he is trustable whether or not he can plan things whether or not he has structure discipline focus direction he can protect and provide like he's supposed to be demonstrating these things to her as a woman yes our role is to lean back and observe that's a really important role and that's one of the reasons why we're not supposed to be doing all these other things and worrying about all these other things because as a woman we have a lot we have to do as far as making sure a man is going to be safe safe in the sense that he is not going to hurt us but also safe in a sense that he is going to be able to protect us from other people that want to hurt us. That is a huge responsibility that is put on women. So anyone who thinks that women have it easy in the dating world clearly does not understand the role that women actually have to play in dating. We have so much work we have to do in observing and making sure that the man is actually the man he is presenting himself as and that the man is actually going to be able to be a protector and provider for us in a lot of ways, not just financially and not just physically. And this is actually one of the reasons why you see a lot of dating advice that tells women not to tell a man too much too quickly and not tell a man too much of what she wants. It's a fine line there, right? Because as women, we need to learn to be able to express our wants and needs to a man. However, if too early on in the relationship, you start to tell a man exactly what it is that you want, then you open up the possibility for something like love bombing, which I'm going to get into. So what love bombing is, is when somebody basically just comes on gangbusters and they pretend to be everything that the person wants them to be. They pretend to be the dream partner and very often what happens then is they'll they'll do a pull away then they'll start in with the hot and cold hot and cold which usually enforces a trauma bond between two people i do have a video talking in more in depth about trauma bonding so i'm not going to dive into that too much love bombing often happens in psychologically abusive relationships it's very common with narcissists sociopaths things like that it's not exclusive to that and i would actually say that unfortunately in our world today because we have a lack of true masculine leadership and we have a lot of men pretending to be masculine and kind of teach young boys how to be like pickup artists and how to manipulate women and things like that a lot of young men are being taught to do these things like they're not necessarily narcissists themselves they're just being taught that love bombing a woman and things like that is actually the way to get a woman so there's a lot of men who are doing this because they think that this is how they're supposed to date unfortunately this kind of mentality is never going to get you a solid healthy relationship so again some people are doing it intentionally to manipulate someone i think some people are doing it because they think that this is how people date and at the end of the day if someone is doing this to you it's really important that you just be aware of it and not fall for the manipulation why they're doing it is a bit less of your issue it's their issue it's really important that you know the warning signs of it you don't have to be a wounded feminine person to get involved with love bombing however if somebody is more in their wounded feminine they will tend to attract people who love bomb and they will usually be more likely to fall for it 
So very often if somebody is inclined to love bomb someone, they're going to be more drawn to someone who exhibits signs of wounded feminine energy. They don't necessarily think consciously like, oh, this person is in wounded feminine. But they're probably going to seek out somebody who opens up too fast, too soon, who is more trusting because that's a person that's going to be easier to love bomb. So Joe dresses up as this millionaire to basically seduce Sugar because now that Sugar is confiding in him when he's Josephine as to everything that she wants from a man. He then dresses up like this millionaire to to pretend to be the type of man that Sugar has said that she wants. So he pretends to have a yacht. He pretends to, you know, be a multimillionaire and implies that he is the heir to the Shell oil fortune. Wears glasses, is reading. Like, again, she wanted a man who was intelligent. That's why she wanted a man with glasses. Go for the intelligence, don't go for the glasses. The glasses does not mean a man's intelligent, but that's what she thinks. So he's now created this whole persona to pretend he is someone that Sugar wants. He does that and lures her in. And it's interesting in the conversation because she then starts pretending that she's somebody else to try to win him over. Now that's where you get into this dance here. And again, this is a comedy, so it's supposed to be funny, but when you really know what's actually going on here, it actually feels very disturbing, right? They're both pretending to be somebody else. She kind of is acting like she's this Ivy League educated, um, you know, debutante and that she is just playing in a jazz band for fun, even though you can tell she loves jazz music, but he's sort of like, some, some like it hot, that's where the line comes from. It's like, some like it hot, meaning hot jazz music, um, but he prefers classical music. She, oh, so do I. You know, we just do this for a lark. Like, that's kind of, like, she's, she's now pretending to be somebody that she's not. Now, he knows who she is. He knows she's pretending, so now they're in this really fake, they're both pretending to be somebody that they're not to win each other over. I dive a lot more into this idea of like the shallow superficial relationships versus depth and stuff in my The Thin Man Breakdown. But this is, you're basically creating this like fake false relationship based on superficial wants and needs and these people don't even have the superficial wants and needs that they're pretending to have in each other. So they basically end up on a yacht together. So he does this move essentially and mm, this is where women have to really learn to tune into their intuition and when you're a new wounded feminine you're often very disconnected from your intuition. You're just focused on pleasing somebody else and you tend to get into a lot of neediness. When somebody, in this particular case a man, can sense that neediness and that desire to people please. Part of this sort of love bombing trauma bond thing that happens is he became very cold, right? He became very cold hearted and convinced her he didn't like women, he wasn't turned on by women, he wasn't sexually attracted to women. That kicks in her need to people please and her neediness. She then tries to chase him and seduce him. A truly embodied masculine man will feel very grounded and stable. And that can feel somewhat cold, especially if as a woman that you are used to a man who is very erratic, childlike, more in his feminine energy, even in, more in his wounded feminine energy. A man who's truly embodied in his masculine can feel somewhat cold. Think of like Rip from Yellowstone, right? He has a, a groundedness that to some people could appear somewhat cold. Now, obviously he softens around his wife, but in general, it can feel somewhat cold. It's, it's a grounded energy, it's a stability. Whereas when you have a man who is pretending to be aloof and pretending to be like not interested in you, which is another technique that unfortunately men get taught as a way to manipulate women, is they get cold in this, I'm gonna pretend that I don't want you, I'm gonna pretend I don't like you, I'm gonna pretend I don't, I'm not that into this, I'm not into that to get you to chase me, that's different. Like a masculine being very grounded and stable, that's different than a man who is trying to play uninterested to get you to come after him. If you're used to men, again, who are more needy, erratic, uh, childlike, that kind of thing, it can be difficult to tell the difference because it's very, you know, they both can feel very different from what you're used to. But it's why it's so important as a woman when you tap into your feminine intuition to tune into and also take the time to observe, is this man just grounded and stable or is this man playing cool and aloof to try to get me to chase him. In this movie, what Joe does when he's playing the millionaire is to play very cool and aloof and try to get Sugar to chase him out of desperation. She starts like throwing herself at him basically. And he keeps pretending to be uninterested. That's manipulation right there. Like he's 
tapping into her neediness and desperation and he's leaning back and trying to get her to pursue him. A masculine man is not gonna do that. A masculine man is gonna be grounded in his stability and he's gonna pursue what he wants. He's not gonna like lean back and be like, here, just come to me. That's not a masculine man. As a woman, again, another reason why as a woman, dating is not always easy because we really have to tune into what a man's intentions are and we need to tune into if he's being genuine, is he being a grounded masculine man or is he trying to basically trigger my neediness in order to get me to pursue him. You don't want to fall into that category because that's a recipe for disaster. And you even see it too. Again, he's like hot and cold, hot and cold. And at one point when Joe realizes that he's not going to be able to keep up this facade. Now, of course, in the movie, he starts to fall in love with Sugar because it's a movie. It's movies like this, I think, that convince women oftentimes that the man who's been manipulating you and using you is actually going to fall in love with you for real. I'm not saying in real life that it never happens, but I would not advise banking on that, and I actually would highly advise you not to fall into that trap because that's usually how you end up in a relationship that ends up potentially getting even more manipulative and abusive. See my last breakdown of the movie Gaslight. It can get really ugly. So you have to be careful. And I don't want women to feel like, oh my God, all men are bad or all men are using me or all men are manipulative. No, there are some amazing men in the world. It's just, it's so important to know how to discern the good ones from the bad ones so you don't keep getting hurt by the bad ones. Because the more you keep re-traumatizing yourself with the men who are just looking to manipulate and abuse you, the more guarded you're gonna be and you're not gonna be able to call in a really great man into your life and like magnetize him into your life because you're gonna be so guarded and, and not trusting, right? So it's a matter of you don't want to be so guarded and protective that you don't let anybody in. That's why it's so important to tune into your feminine intuition and be able to take the time and actually observe like, okay, is this man being consistent over time? Is this man, you know, is he showing up in the way that he's saying? Do his words and his actions align? Like all those things are really important as a woman to tune into. It's interesting too when Joe calls Sugar essentially on the phone to break up with her because he knows that he's gonna have to actually like move on and he's not gonna be able to keep up this lie anymore. And when they're on the phone call, she literally says she had a dream about him and listed all these things that she was dreaming about doing for him. She's in this very wounded and oftentimes the wounded feminine can be tied to a woman also being in her masculine because the masculine is doing. So oftentimes when a wounded feminine gets into too much people pleaser mode, she can often then enact some of her masculine energy to think that she needs to do for somebody all the time, right? Again, even in her dream world, she's not dreaming about this man doing things for her. She's in her dream world dreaming about all the things she can do for him. Like that's how much of a, a people pleaser that she's gotten herself into. And I'm not saying that, you know, when you're a woman and you're in your feminine, that you can never do anything for a man. But if you're fantasizing about all the things that you can do for a man and you're desperately trying to do for a man to make him happy, you're probably not setting your own boundaries and owning your own worth enough to be open. And even he even gifts her with a diamond bracelet and it's amazing how she kind of fluffs it off. I mean, it's a really expensive diamond bracelet that Daphne has kind of gotten from this other millionaire and stuff as a gift, and Joe ends up giving it to Sugar. She's kind of like, oh, diamonds, I hear they're worth their weight in gold. Like, if she, she wasn't a gold digger. It wasn't about the gold, the money, the diamonds, the jewels, the yacht. Sugar just wanted somebody with stability who was gonna love her. You know, and she got caught up in this idea of you know, the money, the status, the, the yacht, the everything was her answer to that stability. And that's very common. I think a lot of women, they get, they get labeled as gold diggers because they are going for men with money, power, success, when a lot of them just don't really even care about a lot of that stuff. A lot of them just are so desperate, in a sense, for stability. And they, they kind of have this false idea that if a man has like all this money and power that he's gonna give her stability. Now, obviously, if a man can't protect and provide for her and is gonna keep her in some kind of poverty or something like that, then that's not really gonna feel safe either. And that's not gonna feel stable. However, just aiming for the money, the yacht, if you're not actually aiming for a man who's grounded and stable, that's where you start getting the problem. Again, you aim for glasses because you want a man who's intelligent. Well, there are a lot of men in the world who have glasses who are not intelligent. And there's a lot of men who are intelligent who don't wear glasses. Like you need to aim for the thing that you actually want, not the thing that you think means that somebody might have the thing that you actually want. So of course, because this is a movie, it all kind of like wraps up in a beautiful little bow at the end. But in real life, things like love bombing and the things like enacting 
the trauma bond of taking advantage of somebody who is trying to people please you and then kind of like pulling away and then being available and then pulling away like that kind of thing those kind of manipulative tactics they might get you into a relationship they might get two people together but they're not a solid foundation that you're going to be able to build a life on so you really have to be careful of those things and I'm using this example of a woman and her wounded feminine and the man essentially being the one who is love bombing and who is enacting the trauma bond and things like that. But you know, these situations can go in reverse. If you have a man who's very in his wounded feminine and people pleaser mode, you can you can have these things in reverse. This dynamic with the love bombing, which tends to go along with a narcissistic personality disorder, with sociopaths, things like that. Like those are things that are more, statistically speaking, things that more, you find in more males than you do in females. Women in general, need to be more on alert for things like that which is one of the reasons why it's so important as a woman to heal your wounds it's important for men as well but when we're talking about this situation as a woman if you're finding yourself like not being able to set your boundaries you're finding yourself not being able to own your wants and needs and you're so focused on somebody else's wants and needs you're so focused on someone else picking you as opposed to just embodying the woman that you want to be and then knowing that you will magnetize a man to you that is the man that matches the best version of yourself and i also would point out that the big thing right now that everybody wants to push on people is accountability and I, I've, I've talked about this before in other videos. If men really want to be the leaders, they want to be the masculine leaders, then responsibility and accountability really needs to fall to them. However, as humans, we all do need to take some level of responsibility for the way that our life goes. Unfortunately, and women are more susceptible to this in general, when you talk about psychological abuse, manipulation, love bombing, trauma bonding, things like that. I mean, they can happen to anyone, but women are more vulnerable to these things. Young women are more vulnerable to these things, which is one of the reasons why men who do these things tend to target young women, like very young, like disturbingly young women, because young women are more susceptible because they have not often learned the tools in order to discern whether or not someone is doing this to them or not. And younger women tend to be less tuned into their intuition or less trusting of their intuition. Oftentimes as women get older, they then become, they then learn to trust their feminine intuition more, hopefully, ideally. I hope women watching my video are inspired to learn to trust their feminine intuition. So because of all this, as women, we do need to take the responsibility of healing our wounds and learning, again, to discern between, you know, a, a man embodied in his healthy masculine energy and a man who is going to abuse and manipulate us. All of these things are important. It's important if you do get into a situation like this, it's absolutely important for you to look at, okay, where did I not own my own worth? Where did I not step into and enforce my own boundaries? Where was I falling into the need to people please? Like where was I feeling the need to do too much for this person and I lost myself? Like those things are absolutely important. And you can do all of those things, you know, once you've been in a relationship that maybe wasn't going very well or you have gotten out of an abusive situation. Learning from your past is absolutely important so that you don't keep making the same mistakes. Understanding your patterns and trying to heal the things that are causing you to continually get in these patterns that's all your responsibility but there's a both and that a lot of people miss is that even if you do own up to the things that you did in your life that led you to get into a bad situation with someone that doesn't excuse their behavior towards you so we get so focused on this what's your responsibility what's your role what is what you did in the situation which are all valid things to look at however if you were abused in a situation, as much as you can learn from that and and learn how to not put yourself in that situation again, you also can acknowledge that what that person did to you was not okay. And the both and can live in that situation. It's not an all or it's not an all or nothing. It's not like a it's either the abuser's fault or it's the victim's fault. You can say, okay, what led me to get into this situation? What 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 do I need to embody and heal within myself to not let this pattern continue? And acknowledge that what the person did to you was not okay. Those can be a both and. It's not an either or situation. And I think it's really important to remember because we get a lot in our society right now with accountability to constantly blame the victim. So yeah, this movie was actually a really great example and probably I would say the most obvious example of wounded feminine energy 
in a woman of all of Marilyn's films, at least all the ones that I've done breakdowns of for sure. She is just like so the epitome of wounded feminine victimhood, puts herself down, knows her patterns, but just continues to be a slave to them. Falling for manipulation, people pleasing, uh, you know, not setting boundaries, all these kind of things. Just, just such an example of wounded feminine energy in a woman. I've talked a lot about wounded feminine energy in men, which I do think a lot of men today have wounded feminine energy. And I have other videos talking about that. This was a really great example of seeing how it looks in a, a feminine cord woman. Because Sugar definitely is feminine in her core. She just has so much wounding going on. So if you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, please give it a big thumbs up and be sure you subscribe to my channel. After you watch this video, I recommend that you watch the movie if you haven't seen it or even if you have. See if you can pick up on some of the things that I mentioned in this video. If you have any thoughts about this movie or any of the topics I mentioned or, you know, any video requests, let me know. Leave a comment in the comment section below. I love to hear from you and I love your suggestions. If you're a woman and would like to connect to her feminine energy, I have online courses. Details in the description box below along with links to all my social media accounts. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope you join me next time.